right? So that's the good news. The other good news is that we're here today. We're smiling. We're alive. It's going to be 50 degrees today. Huh? <clears throat> kind of gets, you know, the, the feeling of baseball in the air a little bit anyway. You know, I don't know. A little bit. But I want to go, I want to just uh, communicate for the next few minutes on a topic, and the topic is called Established Faith. Established Faith. I don't think there's anybody alive today that has been a part of the church or been walking with the Lord, those that are lying, I'm sure you can give a thumbs up to this as well, that haven't been challenged at some level in their faith. Not necessarily your salvation, but faith in maybe an area that you're trusting God in or an area that you have been praying for, or an area that, you know, you have uh, believed God for, and it just has not come to pass. So can I get a show of hands? How many of you have ever been challenged in your faith regarding an area of your life? You see, most of us, right? And so, you know, it's almost like, you know, I don't want to say it like this, but I'm going to say it like this, right? That it's almost par for the course. It's almost like built into the system that we would have a challenge from time to time. You know what challenges me, Mitch? Is that Jimmy's Frozen is closing on Sunday. That's just sinful. I'm going to call the owner. And he's down in, in Florida just having a good old time. You know, we've been there so much, we should know how to make it by now, right? So, <laughs> be able to do it ourselves. <clears throat> That's a challenge. For some of you, a challenge of your faith is actually going grocery shopping, just getting back out again. That's a challenge for some people, eh? right? You with me today? And so I want to just talk about this idea of faith because, you know, there was twice in the Bible where Jesus, or the Bible said that Jesus saw their faith, saw their faith. And I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I want Jesus to see my faith. I want to see, but one time this dude couldn't walk, this paralyzed dude, and they, you know, couldn't get to Jesus because there was such a large crowd of people. <clears throat> so instead of getting offended because the place was packed, instead of getting mad because, you know, oh, they don't like me anymore, they didn't save me a seat, they thought, well, we'll just do the next best thing. We're going to rip the roof off the house and we're going to drop the guy through the roof. I think that's some creativity. You know, when you're, when you're in a place where all you know is Jesus, all you have is Jesus in an area of your life, you will do whatever it takes to get to him. I'll do whatever it takes to get to him. It doesn't mean I always get the results I want, but man, I tell you, I find a, a level of peace and a level of joy and a level of comfort, a level of confidence that happens as I continue to push through all the noise. How many has ever had to push through the noise? How many know there's a lot of noise out there? There's a lot of noise in here. God doesn't listen to you. God doesn't, you know, he's not hearing you. You better pray harder. You better pray louder because God's deaf. But I want to take you to Hebrews chapter 11. It's kind of like one of the base scriptures when it comes to faith. And we're going to read from the Amplified Version. And it says, now faith is the assurance. It's the title deed or the confirmation of things hoped for. And the evidence of things not seen. And look what it says in these little, little uh, parentheses here. Let's keep, go to the next screen here. It says, faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical sentence. You know what I feel right now with, with people in church? It's like we know, like, okay, we're, we're, we're back open again. We know that things are happening. But it's almost like our hearts have slowly disengaged in connection with him. 
We know we have faith and, you know, we're trusting Jesus as our Lord and Savior and all that kind of stuff. But that day-to-day stuff, that day-to-day relationship, and I'm not saying for everybody, but I'm seeing a pattern where it's almost like we didn't even realize it, but there was a slow disconnect. There was a slow uh Um, almost like a a wedge that got slowly driven into it. And we know it's Jesus. We know he's the Savior, but there's almost like this disconnect. And now it's like, do I really want to engage at that level again? Do I really want to do this? And I really want to do that? Because faith is something that will require, please hear this, it will require action on our part. I didn't make the rules, but it's just the truth. Faith requires action. I love the way the Passion Translation reads 11.6 even. It says, and without faith living within us, it would be impossible to please God. Some of your translations says, you know, faith, without it, it's impossible to please God. It's impossible without faith. Faith is required to please God. Somebody's like, well, I want to please God. But many times what happens in the church world is we go to doing stuff a whole lot. We go to, you know, trying to do the check marks and the, the check, check off the boxes, like Corey was saying earlier, in order to please God. And listen, faith, faith is what is required in the pleasing. It says this, for we come to God in faith, knowing that he is real. How many know God is real? Come on now. And that he rewards the faith of those who give all their passion and strength into seeking him. This is a funky time that we live in. Anybody know what I'm talking about, right? It's like we're thankful that we're loved by God. We know that we, you know, we love him. We're at the best of our ability at, you know, how we live. And, but I wonder how many of us could actually be honest enough to say, I feel that disconnect. I feel that disengagement. I feel that. And it's not that God is mad at you. It's not that God hates you. It's not that you hate God, but that you feel that disconnect. And this is why I'm communicating this morning this way, because this may be a journey of reconnecting at a greater level. It's not a one-time wonder necessarily where, okay, let's line the altars up, pray over everybody. That could take place and all that. But it's a reconnection, and it must be a reconnection on purpose. You know, something that you say, you know what, I've just kind of like, and I don't know if you've, you've noticed this with, with some people, it's almost like we're going through a bunch of stuff, we're going through life, but the passion is missing, or the joy, I'm talking the true essence of joy, is missing. And this is what's so cool about how we live, where we live today, is that God will always come and find us in those places and help us bring bring us to a different level. Faith. It says faith is, what did it say? It says faith comprehends as fact what cannot be experienced by the physical senses. In other words... You have this thing on the inside of you. You don't see with your mind's eye or your, your, your physical eye yet, but you see with your heart. You see with your heart. You say, no, no, no. You know what? I, I may feel that disconnect, but, man, I'm engaging back into you. You see, you can see that there's greater on the other side of where you are right now. You can see that there's more on the other side of where you are right now. Just because this thing hit our, our, our society, just because we are where we are today, just because you have listened to the news more than the scriptures or more than what God has to say, doesn't mean it's where you have to stay. It doesn't mean it's where you have to remain. It's one of those messages you don't get a whole lot of, hey, yo. You get these kind of things like, leave me alone. Leave me alone. You're not a pastor today. You're a pester. You know, it's like, Lee, come on. Back off. 
<laughs> but if we jump over to Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, it says, Therefore, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, walk in union with him, reflecting his character in the things you do and say, living lives that lead others away from sin, having deep been deeply rooted and now being continually built up in him and becoming increasingly more established in your faith, established in your faith. You see, here's the interesting thing. When Jesus saw these dudes, this one dude that got lowered down through the roof, please get this. It's like, this is, this is one of those things. There's a difference between Jesus seeing their faith on the front side and being established in your faith as you continue to journey with him. You see, when Jesus, there was two parts. One, this guy was got lowered through the roof, and the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith, which is, a, which is a remarkable thing. And then there was one centurion dude who was over a bunch of people who had no reason to submit to Jesus, comes to Jesus and talks to him about a sick child or a dead child. And he's like, you know, had no reason doing that. And, Jesus, and the Bible said that Jesus saw the faith. Now, I believe as we journey with Jesus, he can still see our faith. But there's something about an established faith. The kind of established faith right here where it's saying established in your faith. The kind of faith that says, you don't need to do anything for me ever again, and I'm still going to praise you. You don't need to do anything for me again, and I'm still going to love you. I'm still going to walk with you. I'm still going to love people. I'm still going to advance your kingdom because you have done enough for me up to this point. I know you're going to do more for me, but you don't have to do anything more because you've done enough up to this point for me to say, I'm all in. The kind of established faith that says, you don't even need to part the waters. I'll swim through the waters if you need me to. The kind of faith that says, you know what? I'm just grateful. I'm just grateful for where I am today. I don't need to, you know, go out and save the masses. I don't need to go out and do this. I don't need to be known. But you know what? All I need is you. The kind of established faith that says, I ain't going anywhere. I may feel this disconnect, but you know what? I'm pushing right back in. I'm pressing right back in. You see, the kind of established faith that I see in many people, doesn't matter if we're in the midst of a, a, a global deal or not. It doesn't matter if the economy shifts or not. It doesn't matter if this or not. My eyes will not shift from you. Anybody in the house have some established faith in this place? Anybody online got some established faith in this place? Come on now. Established. I just ain't going anywhere. I ain't going anywhere. I'm not going to allow that discouragement. I'm not going to allow that disappointment. I'm not going to allow myself to be disillusioned. I'm just not going anywhere. You see, when I made a decision a long time ago to follow Jesus, I didn't do it because of all the things he was going to do for me. I did it because of what he already did for me. I did it because my heart became aware to the fact that, you know what, I didn't deserve what Jesus did, what Father gave, but you know what? He did it for me. I didn't do it because who was president. I didn't do it because who was governor. I didn't do it because this or that. I didn't do it because of the economy. I did it because of what he already did. And something is established in my heart, and many of you can attest to this for you. You say, it doesn't matter. I, I am all in. It doesn't matter. I am in. You see, that's what you call an established faith. One of those ones that just like, you know, people look at you and they're like, how do you stay joyful in this thing, man? How do you stay, you know, keep your heart right in this thing, right? How, how are you not like, you know, you know, getting all mad at God? And how come are you not cussing people out? I don't know, I do that. But, you know, it's like, <laughs> how are you not doing this? And how are you not doing that? And how are you not doing this? And how are you not doing that? 
It's because I have an established faith. Not in the, this is a difference between when you read the story of Moses and you look at the children of Israel. Moses knew the ways of God. The people knew the hand of God. In other words, they were focused on what God could do for them rather, on, rather than who God was. You see, when you get to know God at a greater level of, for who he is, his character, his ways, all the stuff, guess what? Being all in is a non-issue. It's just a given. Because you find out who he is. You find out what he's about. You find out how much he is actually for you. And maybe contrary to your thinking, God actually likes you. I know I say it often, but you need to know it. God likes you. And establish faith I tell you what, it's not something that we just arrive to and we just there and it's like, now I'm established. No, no, no. You don't want to know how you get established by getting, going through some stuff. We'll put it that way. You go through some stuff and you find out how established you really are in your walk with God. Something happens, and people are like, oh, I'm leaving that church. You know, they're just a bunch of weirdos. Yeah, you're just going to jump to another church with a bunch of weirdos too. Why? Because you're there. <clears throat> well, they didn't look at me right. Have you seen your face? When's the last time you showed teeth and smiled? And I'm not talking about pulling them out and waving them. I'm talking about actually smiled. And what's amazing is sometimes these things happen from people you think are established in their faith. Ayo. And you're like, wow, I never saw that coming from somebody. Never called, saw that coming. And it's kind of built into the system that you're going to have an opportunity to, you know, for your, for your faith to be established. And that doesn't come because things are all hunky-dory and everything's great. There are sometimes challenges. Ja uh, Timothy tells us this and James tells us this, that sometimes our faith will have some kind of testing. And every time that I've gone through these things, I've always been challenged by focusing on the ways, the character of my God. Versus the hand of my God. And when I get mad at my God, it's because I focus on what God isn't doing in my life rather than focusing on what he's already done in my life. No one else has been there before, right? So I'll just share my story with you. The reason I'm saying that is because this is a season for the church to reveal that they are established in their faith and in the character of God. Not to reveal how weak-minded and how double-minded we are. Now, I'm not, yeah, I know I'm some pride preaching to the choir. Maybe it's for one person. Maybe it's for nobody. Maybe it's for the church in the next state. Maybe it's for Pastor Chad's church down in Georgia. Hi, Pastor Jed. <laughs> he knows I love him. He knows I'm kidding. I love those guys. But can I ask you a question? Have you ever seen the church globally more wishy-washy, more <clears throat> divided, more really revealing that we aren't established in our faith in the character of our God and even in the hand of God than what we have experienced over the last several months. Anybody know what I'm talking about? 
You listen to this guy over here, and oh, man, all, uh, the world's coming to an end. Oh, my gosh, this is it. This is it. You know, uh, grab your, your, your stuff and dig your hole in the ground and run and hide. This is it. This is the big one. You got this guy over here saying this, and this lady over here saying this, and this lady over here. You got me saying this. You got you saying this. You got this over here. And it's all this wishy-washy, all this up and down, all this all over the place. And when I'm, I'm asking the question today, where are the people who are established in the character of their God? In the character, the ways of God. Come on, seriously. How many of you want to be established in the character of who our God is? How many of us in this house that say, I don't want to be tossed around, right? I don't want to be going back and forth. I just want to be established. And some of you are veterans in the faith, and you're an amazing inspiration to so many people, and I appreciate that so much. But I got to tell you, we got some people out there that, man, they're just this way, this way. Have you ever seen a Christian? And just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And it's like, calm down, world. Just calm, calm down. Calm down. Calm down. The person of God, the person of Jesus hasn't changed one bit. The same power that existed back in January of 2020 still exists today in 2021. In fact, in Matthew chapter 9, man, this is uh, interesting because, you know, it's a popular story in the Bible. It's verse 27 to 31. I just want to read it real quick because I find this to be interesting. By this time, there had been a little bit of a, a following with Jesus. So a lot of stories have been told, a lot of Rumors have been spread. A lot of, you know, information was going on in the streets as far as this Jesus. And in verse 27, it says that Jesus went on from there. Two blind men followed him. I find that to be one of the most intriguing parts of Scripture in the New Testament. Two blind men followed. And not only that did he follow him. And they were calling out, have mercy on us, son of David. When he had gone indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them. Okay, listen. You go inside the house blind. <clears throat> you see, when you really want Jesus, it doesn't matter if you can't walk. Like, come on now. It doesn't matter if you can't walk and you got to go through a roof. It doesn't matter if you're blind and you got to just tumble and stumble and all kinds of stuff. As long as you get to him. I'll say it again. As long as you get to him. <laughs> Two blind men follow Jesus. I mean, if they can do it, I think we can do it. I'm just saying out loud. If these two blind men, and listen, they knew enough, they heard enough. They, they were blind, but they weren't deaf. So they heard the stories about this Jesus. They heard, and then, can you only imagine the hope that, you know, as a blind man, you can't see anything, but you could hear all kinds of noise, and you could hear people talking. Oh, there's this Jesus, and he did this over there, and he did Jesus over there. And all of a sudden, you hear this, this, this rustling. All of a sudden, you hear this noise, this crowd begins to, you know, happen, and it's coming by, it's coming close, and it's like, okay, oh, and then you hear people, hey, it's Jesus. Jesus is coming close here, man. Jesus is, is, and all of a sudden, these two blind men were like, okay, okay, I can't see it, but I can hear I understand, too, what's so important about the, the, this time was that if you were sick, you weren't wanted. If you were sick, you had issues like this. You were outed. Don't touch them or it'll jump on you. Sadly, that's still the way many, you know, the, some religious people still believe. Don't talk to somebody who smokes because you'll get on you. Don't talk to somebody who drinks because it'll get on you. 
Don't talk to somebody who sins. It'll get on you. And it's really on them. Let's not go there right, right now. We're just kind of like... <clears throat> There's blind people just sitting there, and all of a sudden, the ruckus begins to happen in Jesus, and they knew enough to follow him, and they end up in the house. You know, there comes a certain point where you don't give a rip. There comes to be a certain point where you just don't care anymore. You take off the church clothes. I'm not saying physically, so relax. You take off the church clothes and you just wear the real clothes. You know what I mean? You stop trying to put the show on. You stop trying to prove to other people that you're really walking with Jesus when you know in your heart there's a disconnect and there's a divide and there's a separation. But we've got to put the show on because I don't want anybody to know. You see, these blind people and the dude who got lowered through the roof didn't care. In fact, when you don't care, you begin to break some rules. You begin to go against the law of some things. Even the lady who had the bleeding issue for nine years began to go against the law because you don't touch somebody when you're sick. This lady had been sick for nine years, and I tell you, people didn't want anything to do with her. You're gross. You're out of here. No, no, no. Just get away. We don't have any answers for you. Just go. But she knew enough to say, I don't care. Hey, crowd, I know you're there. Get out of my way. I'm touching Jesus. You know what's sad sometimes and is that somebody who is like this, like so desperate for Jesus actually reveals in many of us how desperate we aren't in Jesus. Did I say that? I tell you, what it reveals, what it reveals is the fact that we have arrived and you're behind. And their desperation to get a hold of the Messiah, to get a hold of Jesus, actually reveals in us how much of a separation has really happened between us or how much passion has been lost in our walk with Jesus or how much fire has been, you know, kind of died down in our walk with Jesus. And we begin to you know, look at it like, you know, they, 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 they're going against the rules. They're going against the stuff. Don't, it, sh it shouldn't be like this. It shouldn't happen like this. And these two blind men, they come in and he asks them, do you believe that I am able to do this? Do you believe that I am able to do this? You know what's amazing is that we as followers of Jesus ought to be really good at hanging out with people who aren't walking with Jesus. Listen, I was once that person. Anybody can say you were? I wasn't always a pastor. I wasn't always a preacher. I wasn't always... You know, the perfect man I am today. And I just, Robert, don't shake your head, man. I see you back there, amigo. Of all people that I thought would be in my corner about this, I thought it would be you. Normally I pick on Matt, but today I'm picking on you, brother. Come on now. I'm going to play the song I want to play, and you got to come up and do a spontaneous dance. That's scary. That ain't happening. But I was once that person that somebody needed to come alongside, right, and be okay with hanging out with somebody who didn't have it all together. Have you ever noticed that Jesus didn't have to go look for ministry, but ministry came and found him? Jesus, Jesus didn't have to go out and say, you know, put up a booth and say, one dollar for healings. Come on up. 
but ministry found him. Some of you might ask the question someday, why am I always around people who are jacked up? Why am I surrounded all the time with jacked up people? Can't I have one normal person? And then you look in the mirror. You're like, well, I don't live with one, so I'm good. You know, it's like. <laughs> but ministry always found Jesus. Somebody told me this a long time ago when I was complaining. I was a youth pastor, and I was complaining about some things. And one of my leaders said, um, God knows, Mark, who to entrust people to. I never complained about things since then, since that time. I never complained about that one thing. Because I was like, man, every time I, uh, every time I turn, there's, there's this issue, there's that, there's this, there's this, there's this, there's that. I was just surrounded. It's like it, it never stops. And, and he says, God knows who, ent- who to entrust people who need help, people who need love, people who need mercy, people who need grace. You see, ministry will find you. Ministry will find you, people will find you when you have that character. I'm not talking complete character, but the character, the essence, the heart of Jesus. You don't have to go looking for it. It'll find you. God will know who to bring, that that person who's addicted, and bring to you. Jesus many times just minded his own business and ministry found him. Then he said, do you believe that I am able to do this? Now, most of you would say, most of us would have said in that moment, I hope so. We've been like, I don't know, man, that's two blind people. Been blind a long time. Do you believe I'm able to do this? I wonder how many of us would confidently, and I'm not talking about blind, I'm talking about any issue that you might be going through in your life. Do you believe that he is able to do it? Now, for some of us, you have been going through this issue for months and months and months and months, so your yes is maybe not as much of an exclamation point after, at the end of it. It could be, man, I've trusted you, I've been trusting you, and, and I haven't quite seen the fulfillment of it. And I'm not standing here today saying when you go home, everything's going to be hunk door because you said yes. But I just want to kind of help you re-engage back into hope. To re-engage back into a passion of belief again. That you re-engage and come back to a place, if you're not there already, that you are found guilty of faith. At the end of the day, when I lose my last breath on this earth, I want to be known as a man guilty of faith. May not have seen everything, may not have experienced anything, but I just want to be known as a man of faith. That's all. How many is with me today? I want to be found guilty of faith. As imperfect as it might be, I want to be found guilty. So if Jesus is asking, do you, do you believe I can do this? Um, even if it's a small case, yes. I would give that. And then he says this, according to your faith, let it be done to you, and their sight was restored. Jesus warned them certainly not go out and spread the word, but they did it anyway. So apparently they still needed to work on obedience. <laughs> but at least they got the yes part right. You know, it's like, <clears throat> according to your faith, let it be done unto you. This faith business is, it's not an arrival. Well, now I got faith, and now I got faith. Well, you have faith in this season, this moment, which is really good. But I promise you, three years down the road, five years down the road, ten years down the road, you're going to run into an issue, and you're going to need to step into a greater realm of faith in that moment. When I look at Tracy and I's life over the past, we're in, man, March 7th, 
29 years you've been stuck with me. <laughs> Holy Toledo. Doesn't get any better than this, does it? <laughs> Not like putting you on the spot. I'll, I'll ask you that when I get home. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than this, does it? <laughs> 29 years. But we've been through a few things, and the issue is every one of the things we've been through has required a level of faith that has been imperfect. It's been imperfect. And I think sometimes what happens is we look at this and we say, you know, it's got to be this or it's got to be that. And I, I, I want to tell you today, get the perfection out of the equation and just get your heart back into the equation. If it takes you 35 times in one day to lean back into him and say, I trust you, I'm in, I, I have faith in you, I believe then do it. If, that, if it takes every day, if it takes every week, whatever it takes, the issue is we are called to a place of a, of a faith journey. And in that faith journey, it's not a straight shot up. There are some dips and there are some valleys. There are some mountaintops. Anybody that's been walking with Jesus over five years know what I'm talking about. There are some moments you're like, do I really want to do this anymore? Do I, is it really worth it anymore? Do I really want to engage again? Do I really want to worship? Do I really want to praise? And at the end of the day, you come back to the place of saying, you gave it all for me. I'm in for you. I trust you. I look to you. Let me give you a few things as we close and wind down. Are you okay today, church? I just want to give you four things. To Actually, we'll give you five things regarding faith. We'll go through them quick. Number one, faith is always energized by love. Faith is not energized by how much we think we got to spin our wheels and, you know, get all busy for God and all the stuff. Faith is energized by love. You can do a lot of things for God, but if it's not energized by love, then it's energized by a religious, legalistic mindset, which will burn you out and put you at a place of comparing with other people. It'll actually get you mad at God because I'm doing all this for you and you didn't show up here. So then we get into entitlement, we get into rights. So it must be energized by love, which is a good opportunity for us to step back and take a look and say, why am I doing what I do? The second thing is faith is our present connection to our future potential. It's our present connection. And listen, the, the best way to... To connect presently in your faith journey is to be honest enough to say where you are. I had a difficult time being honest. I've been raised in church my whole life pretty much. And so I had a difficult time growing up being honest with God and saying, hey, I'm just not feeling this right now. I'm not feeling it, but I trust you. I'm, I'm not really happy with you right now, but I love you. Anybody been there before, right? You, you, you know what I'm talking about? It's like... So in order to pre presently connect in this faith journey, honesty is pretty important. Jesus was talking to a lady at the well. She said, he said, there's coming a day when people will worship me in spirit and in truth. And I think sometimes we get a hold of the spirit part and we just say, yeah, I felt it, man, gooseys and, you know, uh, feely wheelies. And I, oh, I got to sway a little bit. I got to dance. Oh, really? I felt God in that worship service and all that stuff. But little did we know that there's a truth part of it. And the truth part of it is being able to willingly say, God, I'm still struggling with that hatred and that bitterness and that anger and that frustration and that disappointment with you. But in the midst of it, I'm still going to worship you. You understand? We don't worship to cover up our issues. We worship to connect with a God to help us with our issues. <clears throat> hmm. I might get somewhere today. Faith converts heaven's heavenly provision into earthly supply. Faith does that. Guys couldn't see, now they see. All of us could say, we once did not see spiritually. And now we see. 
And once you see it, you can't unsee it. How many have seen some things that you've seen that you said, I wish I never saw that before? <laughs> I used to deliver pizzas in high school. I walk up some of those doors. I saw some stuff I never want to see again. <clears throat> Lady came to the door one time in her robe. That's all I got to say. I never ran a 40 in two seconds flat before, but that day I did. I was like, that, this lady's scary. I'm out. <clears throat> Stuff you read about, not see. <clears throat> Woo. Jesus, help us all. <clears throat> yeah, my most wonderful time of delivering pizzas, we were in the winter. I had my little brother with me because no one could sit with him at home. So I'm, I'm, he, he stayed in the car while I got the pizzas and came back out and delivered. So it was real legal. And uh, <clears throat> I hit this ice patch and gonna, I thought I was going to hit this boulder. I wasn't going that fast either. I thought I was going to hit this boulder and stop. But no, it decided to roll up and over. So now I'm upside down in my car. Brother gets out. That was awesome. <laughs> car got impounded. It was a beautiful experience had by all. That was my last day delivering pizzas. <laughs> good thing is I got the pizza to the house first. <clears throat> yeah, I'm a good boy like that. Fourth thing, faith doesn't guarantee security and comfort. Faith doesn't guarantee security and comfort. How many have found that to be the truth? How many don't like that one? <clears throat> You're like, come on, I'd like some more, please. And it does. Obviously, the results are, that, you know, there for that. But, man, it doesn't always mean that. I mean, there's sometimes, you know, in that Old Testament, there was some stuff. People were in faith that had to cross over in some water, man. I'm telling you, they had to do some stuff that they probably didn't want to do. But the results were amazing from what they did. If you want to know somebody who didn't have comfort, but you might want to talk to Jesus about how comfortable it was, what he had to go through. But here's the last thing that I want to leave with you today. Just to remind us, to encourage us as some of us are going to re-engage their hearts back into Jesus. That faith is always, ultimately, rewarded by God. I'm so glad he's the rewarder and I'm not. Are you with me today? I'm, I am so glad that he rewards. Tracy and I have seen so many times when we didn't know what we were doing a lot of times, you know, there was moments where it was like, okay, I think I'm supposed to go this way. So we take a step and we move forward and we move forward and we move forward. And all of a sudden, there was a moment where God would reward that particular decision or those decisions. And next thing you know, you're like, wow, I wish I had known this back then. It would have been a lot easier to take those steps. But can I encourage you today? Just because you're maybe struggling in your mind regarding an issue with God doesn't make you a bad faither. It doesn't make you a weak faither. To me, it makes you a real faither. And I think it's okay to be able to go before God in prayer and say, God, I don't know, man. I've been trusting you in this. I've been working through this, and I, I'm just struggling with this. But yet, I'm going to trust you. Yet, I'm going to look to you. Yet, I'm going to keep my eyes on you. Yet, I'm going to continue to follow you. I think it's okay. I don't think it's okay. I know it's okay. But church, he is a great rewarder. He's a great rewarder. If you have seen the greatness of his reward in your life, can you just show me your hand real quick? Just let me see who I'm talking to. You see what I'm saying? He's good at rewarding people of faith. Can we stand on our feet this morning?
The scripture I want to close with is this. Psalm 51, 11. David's writing and he says, God, and I'm going to read out the message translation. It's the one that says, restore to me the joy of my salvation or your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit. spirit. And the message it says, God, make a fresh start in me. Shape a genesis weak from the chaos of my life. Don't throw me out with the trash, which he never would do, or fail to breathe holiness in me. Bring me back from the gray exile and put a fresh wind in my sail. God, make me a fresh start. Shape a Genesis week. In other words, take me back to that beginning. Take me back to that place where it all started. Put a fresh wind in my sails. Let every head bow just for a moment today. How many could use a fresh wind in their sail today? Can you do me a favor? And you can you keep that hand up today and just I could use a fresh wind. Fresh wind in the sail today. Shape in a Genesis week. Father, you see every hand that is raised today. You see every person online giving a thumbs up if that's you today. Father, so many thoughts, so many swirls, so many things that are going on. I pray today, right now, that you, that they would experience you, a fresh wind. They would experience a Genesis week. A fresh wind in their sails today. Fresh fire.